So am I not on mute? Okay, that's good. Um, I'm going to talk really fast. This is coming from an outside world, sort of, so I, I hope that I can at least help you understand it. Um, but I'm including a lot of references and things that you can look up later because you can get the notes online uh, after the talk is done. So um, we're going to talk about fonts. Who am I? If I look familiar, for many years I was a reporter embedded solely in the free software hacker community. Then I, I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway, I went away and I, I came back after a year and I'm working on font things these days. Um, Fonts are weird, and let's just get that out there. In particular, they have this property where they are static shapes, but they get executed, or parts of them get executed, or at least interpreted by a renderer. There are certainly other components that we use in our free software stack that have this property. Themes for GTK come to mind, uh, certainly SVGs, uh, some web content, game resources. You can probably think of some others. So it's not alone in that respect. Uh, one distinct difference, though, is that users will use fonts on their system to create content of their own at will. And that's not necessarily true of the other things. So you may, you may care about them in a different way because of this sort of a distinction. Um, and regardless of how weird they are, you have to comply with their licenses. Uh, what happens if you don't? Let's look at some examples. Um, you can get sued. This was a survey that this guy did just using the GitHub search API last year. Hundreds of thousands, and the search API limits the hits that it returns. So Probably more than that. Any, any commercial proprietary font you want to find, probably in there. He was giving this talk to type designers, so this was foundries who will at least contact you and demand that you get a license. Uh, lesser things can happen too. Mailpile is a, a mail app, and they used a font that was free to use, but not free to redistribute. And they had to change that. You can inconvenience your own workflow if you don't pay attention to these things. You may just have other more practical matters, like this is more well-known, Wikipedia, Wikimedia decided it couldn't buy licenses for everyone to recreate their logo and their word marks, so they had to change the font they used in it. Um, anyway, when we, when we talk about licensing issues, there's about three dimensions we can examine. They are not Euclidean dimensions, though. There's the law, there's the community norms, and then there's the licenses that we actually use. Um, and bear in mind, though, that community norms are subject to a lot of wiggle room depending on how you define both of those terms. Um, so let's do the law really quick. Uh, the typeface is not copyrightable. And when we say the typeface, we mean the design, the look as you see it if you're a human being. On the other hand, files are. Digital files are copyrightable. That's how a lot of software uh, copyright and copyleft works. Um, typeface names can be protected as trademarks. And in fact, that's the most common thing you're going to run into, legally speaking. Uh, on the other hand, Typefaces can be protected by design patents, but that rarely happens. I think Adobe is the only foundry that ever does this, as far as I'm aware, and there's reasons for that that we'll see in a minute. Um, and this is, I'm talking about how it works in the US. Um, we can go back and see how we got here. These are the cases you can look up if you care about these things. Uh, 1974, Eltra tried to copyright a top typeface and got told by, I think Ringer was the copyright office chairperson, however that works. No element, either alone or in combination, can be separately identified as a work of art. Uh, that doesn't feel good if you work on typefaces all the time, I'm sure. Um, 76, the Copyright Act, I guess, got revisited, and the House Committee on this looked at it and said, there's nothing here that uh, fits into the meaning of the Copyright Bill. Uh, 1988, things changed a little bit. This is the first time that the Copyright Office distinguished between the design and software files. And obviously in the 80s, this is when the whole software industry was working through copyrights and EULAs and things like that, which it hadn't done necessarily in decades past. Uh, 92, they revised that a little bit. Sorry, I should back up, actually. Uh, in this distinction that they made initially, they said that your copyright notice should include a disclaimer about the design issue. In 92, they realized that didn't make any sense, so they dropped that. Um, how about everywhere else? Well, Japan is explicitly the same as the US, where you can't get a copyright. A lot of places, a lot of jurisdictions, there's no real um, case law or anything. The UK and Germany are the only two places I've found where there is copyright for typeface designs. However, that doesn't make any difference because you have to sell, if you want to make a living in this, you have to sell to anyone in the world. And anyone in the US can buy your typeface and doesn't have to follow that. Is this urgent or? Oh, 
okay, that, that you, there's a, there's a distinction there. He, he's, he's saying that um, a typeface to meet the test of copyrightability in Germany has to pass some originality test is what I'm, is, yeah. Um, in any case, they don't really bother um, because foundries in Germany want to sell to everywhere else in Europe and to the US. Uh, the patent thing comes from Adobe suing SoftKey, trying to get a patent on the typeface, and they were told that you could get a design patent, which is one of those funky things about the shape of your iPhone, but you have to follow some, some conditions in advance, like not showing the design to anyone for at least some predetermined amount of time, a year or two, I think. Uh, the trademark thing, this is what you normally see because well, it makes sense, right? The, the name is what people see in the font menu, after all. And you generally want to have your company name somewhere visible to these people. So um, it's sort of the only option available. And that's why it gets uh, so much attention. Another example, I don't know if anyone recognizes this name, Rasmus Anderson. Um, he has this font that he released called Interface in 2017. He's a, he was a big shot Silicon Valley web guy, worked for Facebook, I think, some other places. Made it big with Dropbox. Uh, he announced this typeface on August 27th. That's the Twitter URL. This is the announcement. After a year of work, here it is. Uh, you can see the time on there, 5 a.m. I assume there's some, this is just when I looked at it, uh, whatever jurisdiction I was in. That's what it looks like. It's on the left. On the right is Roboto because he basically took Roboto and tweaked it, which sort of came up when people started getting angry at him. But just a few hours later, somebody said, by the way, there's already a font called Interface. Were you aware of that? And um, this is what that link was. Interface that already existed was by Dalton Mogg. Dalton Mogg um, created the Ubuntu font. They actually work on a lot of free software projects. Um, they're not going to take this lightly. And if you were reading ahead, you see his response. Yeah, I knew about that. This is not going to end well for him, obviously. Uh, and in fact, it didn't just a few weeks later. And Dalton Mogg mentioned this to GitHub, and he had to change the name of the font, right, to enter UI. Is that better or worse? I will try not to take a position on that. Um, the best irony I, I found on this is someone responding to him said, hey, what would happen if somebody took a common word like Dropbox and tried to separate that? And he was like, yeah, but that's not a common word. Um, I don't know how he defines common, but the word existed, certainly. Um, I think my take on this is that when all you have is the trademark, you're going to defend that with no, no gray area. In the FOSS world in general, for name collisions, we kind of put up with those in hopes that unless someone is dying, goodwill will just take care of the problem. Um, how did we get to this situation? To understand it, it kind of, like, why is a typeface not copyrightable? You have to understand that um, copying designs of other people has, has always been part of how typefaces were made. Um, it's, people have complained about this. This is 1929. Rudolf Koch is a very famous designer from Germany. And he was like, this is highway robbery. There's Americans stealing my designs. It went the other direction, too. Um, it really picked up speed in the 1840s with stereotyping. If you ever heard that process, or that, that word as we use it today, it comes from this process where you take a mold with plaster or something of a bunch of metal type set out on the page, and then you electroplate it, and you get a plate that you can use without the original metal. And this, people would just use this to copy their competitors' designs. And some foundries, Enskeda, which is a Dutch foundry, just sort of stopped making new stuff of their own and made that their entire business. Um, it kind of got worse in the 1880s when you had milling machines that could sort of automate creating the original version and not having to go through the electroplating process. But it's actually older than that. Going back to like the day after Gutenberg went into business, there were people, OK, I can do that too. And in a sense, you copy what's successful. What your competitors are offering, you want to offer that too. And you know, it's, uh, it's possible because up until the mid 20th century, the typeface was not a product. It's important to understand that. Originally, typefaces were something that the printer had to make in order to print the book. And the book was the product. And that changed when industrialization took over, because then the real business you wanted to be in was making printing products, making printers, making printing presses, and things like that. And that continued up until the 1960s and 70s. And for those people, the product is the printing machine or the typesetting machine. The typeface or the font is just a feature of that. Uh, but that did change in the 80s. Um, 
Bitstream, you may have heard that. In 1981, some designers left Linotype and started Bitstream, and they took with them all the fonts in the Linotype library. Linotype was still in the machine business at that time. They said they had permission. Not everyone agrees with that. They certainly weren't the only people to sort of take this approach, CompuGraphic, if you remember them, widely regarded as just wholesale copying other people's stuff. Um, and today we have this weird situation where there's a lot of similar fonts from competing companies. A lot of those are revivals, which is another interesting thing to look at. You have a really old typeface from hundreds of years ago. Is it okay to reproduce it yourself? Well, if you search on a site like My Fonts, which is just sort of a general index, you can turn up hundreds of things for Grand John or Garamond, which are the same look. Um, it's, it was originally mislabeled Garamond, and then they figured out Grand John was the guy's name. And they're not all the same, but everyone has it, and they are all basing it on the same model. Um, this is acceptable. This is a community norm thing. And one of the reasons it's acceptable, uh, as long as the designer is no longer alive, anyway, is that we can't escape from the past, right? Like, language, you don't reinvent the alphabet. No one will use it. It has to be something people recognize. So the norm is don't do this when someone is still alive, and make sure you credit the source. Um, the best comparison I can come up with to this is it's a bit like musical quotation. You can do variations on a theme by Bach, but you're supposed to mention that it's variations on something by Bach. Um, and yeah, and acknowledgement sort of recognizes this, that, that it comes from the past and that language is something that has this context that's unavoidable. Um, it's also, there's some practical issues here that no two people will do a revival the same way. This URL, there's a, there's a talk from the A-Type I conference here by Eric Van Blockland, which is currently offline. They're moving from Vimeo to, uh, to YouTube, I think. He gave the same in, in a you know, raster form to 74 people and asked them to digitize it. You don't get the same thing back from all those people. So that's another reason the community norm is it's OK to revive someone else's design, because you're not going to get the same thing at the end of it. Um, this is a really famous quote by Matthew Carter, who's a designer. You see this other places. You don't need to read this. He's talking about Galliard, which is his version of this Grand John font that everyone has done. And he says here, oh, I didn't actually base it on real drawings. I based it on his style. OK. Um, more pertinent, though, if he goes into detail, is that, um, well, you know, the original thing from hundreds of years ago doesn't tell me everything I need to know for today. I have to do new character sets and things. And there's stuff he didn't have to deal with. So yeah, this is another practical reason why revivals are, are accepted. Um, an interesting corner case happened here in Belgium, though. Um, Sans Guild. This was 2011, open source publishing, which is sort of an artist collective. Is there anyone here from OSP? Someone is in town and was maybe going to be here. They auto-traced Guild Sans. And I mean, in software, auto-traced it, and then released it as a font. They were doing a workshop. They did some other things as well the same weekend. Um, there's a blog post about it here. They wrote a letter to Monotype, which owns Gil Sands corporately, to tell them about this and to state their reasoning. And then they mentioned it on Typeofile, which is a discussion forum for type people. The reaction from the community was, OK, that's, that's fine, although they didn't think that the results of the auto-tracing itself were all that great. Um, they didn't get a response from Monotype from the legal people, anyway. Although, what I heard in email just recently was they did uh, later, Monotype did get in touch about a different project of theirs about the name collision for the trademark reasons. Um, and my take on this is that without copyright on the design, trademarks just evolved this way to bear the bulk of the legal protection. Um, it's important to understand that hundreds of years ago, typefaces didn't have names when the printer just made it because they needed to print something. That happened again with industrialization, when people were trying to sell a catalog to you of what you got with their printer. Uh, and trademarks are a big concern for open fonts. Um, there's some rough standards, community norms. You kind of have you know, Adobe Minion Pro. Minion is probably something that they have a, a trademark on. But there's this basic idea that people can use a common name in the middle as long as they specify their name before it. And if there's more than one version, you put that as a suffix on the end. Um, but it's really a bigger issue because of what our open font licenses tell us to do. And that brings us to the third dimension here, the open font license, normally the one we mean when we talk about open fonts. 
uh, you're probably thinking, yeah, but there's actually more than that because there's the GPL, the font embedding exception, which predates the open font license by a few months. Um, I looked in the Debian archive. There's a lot of licenses on font packages out there. They didn't all fit on the slide. You will find Apache, you went to font license, various iterations of the X project, uh, the Aladdin free public license, and when you use GhostScript, it's a different license. There's a LaTeX license in there. PTFFL is a pair type. It's somebody who made their own license. Styx is math font. You'll find the artistic license, GPL without the exception. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, just research this. <laughs> this is a font where the legal status for it being free is the public statement somebody at the company made. Um, have fun with that. Uh, and in reality, if you're running a free operating system, you will have to deal with non-free fonts as well. Varying degrees of non-free, there's academic fonts that people want to use. Um, sometimes you have to. People will install the Microsoft core fonts because they want to, but you know, if you're working on a government project, Dubai font is what you have to use. If you're working on a Red Hat corporate thing, the Red Hat corporate font is Interstate, which is not an open font. So they have to exist on the same system. Um, yeah, yeah. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but mostly when we talk about open fonts, we mean the open font license. Um, this is the URL for it. Uh, it was originally written in 2005. Uh, version 1.1 was just a clarification of wording. It was created by SIL, which is a nonprofit that does linguistic work, and they did it in conjunction with uh, discussions with, with type designers. And in a lot of ways, it's really more like a free content license. It, it deals with use and redistribution and modification. It says derivatives have to be OFL and nothing else. It talks about embedding. It says that the, the document you build with the font doesn't take on the, the, the font's license as a simple termination clause. One thing it doesn't mention, though, is source code. You can apply the OFL to your sources, but you don't have to. It makes sense if you do. I mean, you can say it applies to a painting, but it just doesn't mean anything. Um, and in particular, it doesn't say anything about the source format. So there's plenty of OFL fonts where there's no source at all, and there's OFL fonts where the source is in something like VFB, which is a binary, undocumented format used by FontLab, which was a big font editor 10, 15 years ago. Uh, you don't have to have any build scripts. You don't have to know how, what options are used to generate the font. Uh, and the upshot of that is that just being under the OFL doesn't make it compliant with some standards, like Debian and free software guidelines. That's not my opinion. Um, you will actually get the package blocked for upload if it doesn't have buildable source. And um, there's a lot of those packages ending up in contrib and non-free. Um, other oddities worth mentioning, you are required to bundle an executable if you sell the font. Um, this can be a simple script, but it's sort of, it was designed to assuage the fears of, of type designers. Um, and then there's the other thing I want to talk about. As we mentioned, there's two versions of this. Uh, can we wait a bit? Okay. Uh, there's two versions of this, except there's actually four versions because <laughs> there's an optional clause called the reserved font name clause. It's the third clause, I think. And it says any modified version has to rename the font because I've reserved this name. Obviously, this, this stems from the trademark issue, right, and the, the font issue. That's the actual text of it right there. Um, it's the font name as presented to the users, right? And it's in the definition section. You have to put it in the copyright statement at the very beginning. Uh, and then they're very clear about what modified version means. Anything that deletes or substitutes the original uh, accounts. And that includes things like subsetting a font. If you're serving it over the web, you maybe don't want to send the full font, especially if it's uh, Chinese, which is very large. Um, so that's triggered automatically in those cases. And it includes rebuilding the font if the result is not bit identical. And that can be problematic. Um, SIL has an FAQ about this because it sort of became a bigger issue. Um, and, but they're very clear. Do font rebuilds necessitate a name change? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, in my opinion, this means that you really need to be treating this as a different license. It's different requirements imposed on you if you're using it. Um, Google Fonts, I have some Google Fonts published. They told everyone who had an RFN they had to rename it or you're creating a separate version for us without the RFN because we can't do all this and still manage the project. Um, I can tell you that RFN violations happen. Let's look at an example. Cardo, it's a Debian package. I think it's in Contrib. That's the URL. This is the home page. 
It's a medievalist font. You may think you're medieval, but are you the medievalist? Um, look at the news here. Number two, I'm going to show you what that says. Be careful, there's unauthorized versions out there. They're not the same. People are, are taking things out, reducing the character set. He's upset about this, right? Uh, this is the whole homepage. If you see where that icon is, that's where the license begins. Um, copyright statement, very beginning. Copyright, David J. Perry with the reserve font name Cardo. Okay, the package is in Debian. Let's look at the copyright file there. Copyright, David J. Perry. No mention of the reserve font name. How did that happen? Um, there's a change log that says we had to take the manual out because the manual has these weird conditions on it. Now, as it turns out, the Cardo zip file you download doesn't include the OFL as a separate file, but it is in this manual, it's a PDF. I can tell you that it's also in the font binary in the proper field. Uh, so this is a bug. Yeah, I, I promise I won't file an issue about it. I wanted it to still be true when I was talking about it today, though. Um, but I, I, my opinion is that this stems from us not recognizing that the RFN that's effectively makes this a distinct license that we have to deal with. Um, I can tell you there's a lot of RFN fonts out there. I would ballpark it as like half. It's certainly not like a 5% thing. And they have violations trivial to find. Literally, Cardo was the first one I opened up when I decided to try and find one in the Debian archive. Um, and the interesting thing is that I think most people who use RFNs and their fonts are actually wanting some trademark protection. And it's just, it's available to them so they choose it. So I, I think we could do a better job of offering them something uh, trademarks in general maybe don't get as much attention in free software as, you know, patents and copyrights do. I attempted to, I, I took a stab at this, and I haven't actually pushed anything out to this repository, but um, I think it's worth revisiting. Like, you can offer people maybe a, shall we say, boilerplate trademark statement. The, the difficult thing that I found when I was looking at this is uh, how to determine what's useful for font developers. I think maybe not triggering it on subsetting would be useful. Maybe you could have an option where you just say, okay, you can make a derivative font, you just have to tack a suffix onto the end of your use of the name. I don't know, but um, the whole way RFIN affects packages and the way it affects downstream projects and people who use the fonts hasn't really been talked about. I would like to discuss that. Um, ask me, there's a lot more actually that we could have talked about on the subject of font licensing. There's some really interesting questions about how much you change a font before it's different, and how you attribute people. But yeah, I'm happy to take questions on anything I mentioned today. Excellent, thank you. It'll come back to It'll come back to him. Okay, yes. Fonts nowadays include much more than clips and the drawing, they include code for ligature and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that's software or? Yeah, I am. Um, the, the, yeah. the, the question is, uh, fonts these days include things like, you're talking about open type feature rules, right. which are substitution rules that match sequences and then say replace the, this with a ligature. And those can actually get very complicated in index scripts and in Arabic, where they have to do a lot more shaping than we use. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of in that, that gray area where, okay, it's not general purpose Turing complete language stuff that you're dealing with, but it is meant to be run by an interpreter or a renderer that executes these instructions. And yeah, there, there's other issues involved there too, like the fact that people don't really share that code, even when they're working on open fonts. There may be would be some benefits to treating that more like source code that we could learn from and study. But yeah, it's, it's um, every time they revise OpenType, it gets more complicated. And so the code component gets bigger while the visual component kind of stays the same. Yeah. Don't think Everybody else? Um, well, okay, the question is, is the OFL without the reserve font name better? Um, I guess it kind of depends. It probably depends on what your trademark policy is like for other things. 
I will note that you don't have to put the full name of the font as the reserve part. And this is something a lot of people probably don't realize either. SIL, which created it, their fonts are officially called SIL Gentium or something like that. And in the copyright statement, the SIL part is the reserve font name, Gentium is not. So they've used that to say you can make a derivative and call it Gentium, but just don't call it SIL Gentium. And that's probably a good middle ground for people. I think it's sort of just not well understood by people who release fonts. And, yeah. Like I don't think I knew that until I started putting the talk together a couple weeks ago, so. Yeah. I'm not sure it's well understood by people that consume. Yeah, that's true too. It, it's um, the consumer issue, a lot of the stuff is just hidden from people and that's kind of true for licensing of fonts in general. People will just, they know they have to get a license to use it on the web or to use it in an app or something, but the details probably most people don't look at. Yes? So the question is, if you have an open source project and you have to interact with type designers? With normal designers. With graphic designers. Okay, with, with, with any, if someone is making logos and, and material for you using a font, what do you have to worry about? Yeah. yeah um, you're not, in that case, you're probably not dealing with the issue of making derivatives of the font. So the derivative triggered RFN clause probably doesn't matter to you. And in fact, a lot of the other details dealing with derivatives probably don't matter. What you want is for anyone to be able to download a copy of the font and use it in Inkscape or in Scribus or whatever. The designer should have a license, that's true. Yeah. Well, thanks. Okay, thanks. As, as we set up for our organizers panel, um, I will make a comment about Nate's talk. It is very rare, um, uh, uh, organizers are very expert about this. Nate's talk was really amazing, and we are so glad that he did all this work to study it. And I really want to thank Nate again for being here.